Just one piece of information I would love to have is, are there any designers here? One, two, three, four, yes. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> so, and so, <laughs> and I'll get back to that in a second, but just, um, this is self-introduction. Right, so the mo I, I would say the most important thing about me, Robin Moore, is that I grew up as a free-range kid in the south of England. And by the time I was seven years old, maybe even younger, my mother had no clue where I was and what I was doing. As I roamed the, the woods and fields and streams um, with my neighborhood friends um, and did a whole bunch of really risky stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I survived, here we are. And I think looking back uh, on that, as I'm sure many of you have, um, I am pretty fearless, actually. It's really hard to frighten me. I've been in a lot of different places in my life <laughs> and, you know, take on challenges. Yeah, we can do this, right, sure. So there's something there that I think many of the presenters have um, also mentioned uh, that um, it gives you this sense of empowerment and um, executive functioning and all of that good stuff. So we need to bring that to our children in an era when culture and society is changing dramatically. So um, design for outdoor science learning. So I'm going to try to talk about two related aspects of that. One, how uh, we think as designers about this issue um, at several different levels, the more st strategic, but it's, it's always a multi-level uh, uh, effort here, from the very particular to the general policy, promotion, etc. I'm also going to share a framework uh, that's, in, at least in my mind, embedded in design thinking of how we can support, and looking back on some of my earlier work, um, how we can support science learning in the outdoor environment. And there'll be a, two or three case examples floating around there. And basically I'm talking about this area of, from, from early, early childhood through middle childhood. So zero to 12, maybe, somewhere in there. Okay, so um, thinking as a designer and from the point of view of planning as well as design and management of these kinds of settings, there's three drivers. One being the content, what is actually there, the context and the built form, both the natural living and the non-biotic, non -biotic. so there's a tendency to separate, especially when we're talking about the urban environment and talking about built environment, the nature from the rest of it, but for us it's all one, it's all built, be it a living component or a non-living component, as you see here. So uh, in this park, the, the concrete paving is obviously non-biotic, not, not living, um, the talking bench on the right-hand side where our children are investigating acoustic connection to each other um, through talking through those tubes, but it's also a functional seat, um, is also a manufactured item. And then in the background you see play equipment and the landscape that has been installed there. So this was a scraped-off landscape by and large, and all of the vegetation has been reintroduced there. So that's a living landscape and the whole of it goes to what we would call a built environment, especially in the urban context. So um, the content. The content has these natural systems, be they already existing or recreated or managed to enhance their value. Remnant woodlands, meadows, wetlands, stream corridors, restored sites. I should also say that my um, formal education is in architecture and urban planning, so um, but I've worked and taught in landscape architecture the whole of my professional career, so I have a perspective on these various uh, uh, fields of design 
and always I'm thinking from the particular to the general. And then second, infrastructure. And in this photograph, you see a beautiful example of the interface of this um, abiotic infrastructure and the living just actually bisected here. And these two little kids that are, this is in a, a resort on the coast of North Carolina. And you see the classic, the, the girl in the pink dress is, is holding a stem that she's harvested from this beach ecosystem that's right adjacent, and they're just exploring and interacting with the nature as they pass along the sidewalk. You know, it's a little tiny fragment of their daily life, but just critical because they're able to interact and actually harvest that as a play um, prop, let's say. And then context. So context, as we think about different kinds of spaces that might afford uh, interaction with, with nature for children. There's many different dimensions to that topic, and I won't have time to go into them in any depth, but one critical thing is whether or not the site itself is gated. Is there a, is, is, it has a fence around it, and you have to pass through some kind of gate or entrance to get into it. Um, as in a museum, as in a childcare center, uh, et cetera? Or is it ungated, as in an open park, open space, the green infrastructure of the city, freely accessible? Uh, what is the developmental level of the children that we're talking about across the uh, developmental ranges up until adolescence? Or is it mixed? And there was some discussion of that this morning, where the older children can be essentially um, teaching along the, the younger children or introducing them to um, the continuous expansion of their territories in nature. Uh, what is the reach? Is it, is it um, within the, one of those institutions? Is it neighborhood-wide? Is it community-wide? Is it a, a regional park that attracts folks from across a wide area? What about the social cultural dimensions? traditions. Um, is it an area of the city that's changing dramatically, as in, in a city here, Raleigh? Um, many different kinds of things going on, new, new folks moving in from different parts of the country, different countries, etc. So that becomes a very complex uh, issue to deal with in design. Access. Access has been mentioned several times by pedestrians, by cyclists, by public transit. The, the bigger picture of access, can we actually get there? Like for example, this museum is not on the bus line yet. Urban metrics, so this is a really important one. It's to do with the surrounding density and land use. Is it a big city, a small, a medium city, what, a small rural town? All of those contexts make, uh, uh, frame the, the design problem in a different kind of way. The things that need to be considered and then the local residential density, which is very critical because it will reflect the number of children and the potential for their, their relationships with each other, which is a very under-researched area, although I think it came up many times, not, not exactly framed that way uh, in the discussion we just had, but um, which children know each other? Where, where are my best friends? Do I have friends that I can go out with like I did as a kid. You know, half a dozen kids in the neighborhood, and you're always sharing and relating to each other and exploring the world together, really important. And then latitude, so some really concrete um, constraints here, the growing season, um, the USDA hardiness zones, and then elevation, so north, south, up and down. And local land use policies, building codes, that kind of thing. But the hardiness uh, map is a really important sort of framing of what might be possible and the different palettes and systems, ecosystems of different parts of the country, different parts of the world. So just to illustrate some of those points, um, this is a nature um, play area in a uh, nature center in Ohio and it's gated. And when they installed this space, their membership went up about 
So it's a controlled environment. They can do a bunch of things that you couldn't do in a, in a park, for example. Um, this second example is open woodland that's part of a historic uh, site um, also in Ohio. And the um, gal in the center there is the elementary school teacher. So she's using this space during the week as a field visit from the school, which is right adjacent. The bigger park here is a very well-known historic park. This is just a remnant woodland. And at the end of the afternoon, parents are gathering. The neighborhood is across the street, so it becomes a, a, a special place for that neighborhood that's very well known. Um, these um, kinds of examples are, um, well, I would say about this space, it's very inexpensive to create this if you have a good relationship with the Parks Department and they're on board with all of this kind of thing. So that's, that's in a moderate-sized town in Ohio. This last example is in the middle of Manhattan. It's Teardrop Park, and they're working with a landscape architect in a highly dense residential area. Uh, this space, this small woodland that was created as part of the larger park, um, offers a resource for the very creative um, parks programming staff to create very um, interesting programs. For example, the enchanted fairies and elves that live in that wood, right? And we're going to, uh, for one uh, weekend afternoon, become elves and fairies and figure out how we're going to take care of these really valuable natural environments in our city. <clears throat> Built form is um, something that designers, outdoor um, designers, uh, city planners, we talk about a lot. So it's about the, the shape and size of the site. Is it, is it squarish? Is it rectal? Is it um, linear? Uh, what size? Uh, if we're talking about childcare centers, maybe it can be under 10,000 square feet. Uh, if we're talking about a nature play area, what we found in our work is that between an acre and two acres is, is a pretty good space. You can do a, a, a huge amount there uh, at, a, at a community level. Uh, beyond that, it becomes difficult to manage. It becomes difficult from the supervisory point of view, from parents feeling comfortable in it. These are just lessons learned along the way. Um, site length, meaning if we're talking about pathways and stream corridors and greenways and that kind of thing, um, is it less or greater than a quarter of a mile? Less than a quarter of a mile, probably it's going to be okay for toddlers and preschoolers uh, before they say, ah, it's getting too far. You know, is it interesting? You know, beyond that, pedestrian use and cycle use is very, very different. So um, for, say, a family cycling out of the weekends on a greenway, it's maybe got to be a couple of miles to be interesting. So, but from a pedestrian point of view, much less. So these are all things to consider. Do those linear connectors in the city, pathway systems, <clears throat> streets even, uh, connect up from the residential to these opportunities for interacting with nature, be they school grounds, parks, remnant green spaces that I've been talking about, etc. Okay, site design uh, can uh, is is a is a whole topic in its, of itself, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of um, different case studies to exemplify uh, the importance of actual site design. This is what I would say our group in Natural Learning Initiative is really expert in, is how you put the pieces together, how you, how you mesh the content and the form together to make a whole, how you make it uh, functional. So for example, um, here is um, an overview of a community park, and you can see the pathway system that goes in very circular kinds of ways through the park, so kids are constantly moving. They can play hide-and-go-seek. Um, parents can wander around and be doing something else. The whole space is, is enclosed with a fence. It has a couple of entrances. And inserted in there is these green patches of vegetation that give it a very naturalistic feeling. Um, this is a, a site that has a particular 
this is a different kind of different kind of project. Um, this is a um, site in a neighborhood adjacent to one of the Smart Start County headquarters that is used both as a neighborhood space where our kids, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a retirement community. So it's about grandchildren coming for the weekend and using this space. And during the week, it's used a, as a training site for uh, early childhood educators in the Alamance um, Partnership for Children. So it's a really interesting model. If you start to put some of these dimensions together, you come up with new kinds of ideas. Uh, even to the extent of a um, privately held recreation area, this is still in North Carolina, who took hold of the idea of creating a natural learning area as a space adjacent to their camping site. So it's a trail system that goes off into the woods and we figured out how to make this attractive. And as you're driving down the highway, you get a sign that's pointing uh, to this opportunity for natural learning. So many different kinds of levels here, from parks to neighborhood spaces to quite large regional areas. And then lastly, in coming back to the housing um, situation and the kinds of new higher density housing that is being created as many cities are de densifying, Raleigh being a really good example, but many of the the high growth cities in the country are going in this direction because of land uh, prices rising and also because I think of a growing demand for this kind of more clustered housing. Beyond a certain level, you can deal with the parking in a different kind of way, put it underneath the building instead of on the ground so that the space within the housing complex can be devoted to exemplifying the, the I would say, high practice of sustainable development. So in this case, uh, there was a, a paved over stream that was re-exposed to create this natural resource right within the multifamily housing. This is fairly rare, but it gives you a really good sense of what can be achieved uh, when, the, let's say, the, the, the stars are lined up with the political <laughs> powers that be and the designers working in concert with each other. So we think of um, these spaces, first, in, first of all, in terms of function. Do they work? Are they accessible? Do they um, s respond to different developmental levels of the community? Second, how do they feel? Are they attractive? Are they beautiful? Do I want to be there as a child or as a parent? Someone made the comment yesterday about it's, it's got to be attractive. It's is to older um, adults, otherwise you'll be looking at your watch after 10 minutes, really bored, let's get out of here. So it's got to satisfy a broad range of needs. Third, health. It has to be a healthy space, both from the point of view of human health, satisfying the kinds of things that we just heard from Kathy and also yesterday, in terms of physical activity from, from Carlos, but at the same time it's got to exemplify this is a healthy ecosystem. The two things go together. They're, they're maybe sides of the same coin. And lastly, culture that I mentioned earlier. So our, um, I've got this word that came to my head, complexifying <laughs> culture that we're living in that um, you know, has many challenges uh, now. Um, so we, we, we have to be mindful of working with representatives of the local culture to make all these things work. But then when they're working together, um, this is what I would call, this is high quality um, environmental um, intervention that is gonna satisfy these, these kinds of science learning needs. Okay, so um, Kathy talked quite a bit about um, motivation and this is the kind of space that we think motivates children to engage with nature and learn from nature. And uh, you, you can find various kinds of discussions online about this, but uh, we use six Cs. So this intrinsic force of curiosity that children have 
is that you don't have to tell them to <laughs> do anything, they'll just do it. Uh, choice, choice of diversity, of, um, of providing a, a range of different opportunities for different kinds of kids from different cultures, different ages, the content, the actual thing itself, what, what, what do we have going on here? It's damp, it's water, there's many different kinds of ways of interacting with this environment. It has, uh, it has vegetation, it has insects and wildlife, surely there. It brings kids together collaboratively. Uh, again, this was mentioned. And Kathy and I didn't get together to share our <laughs> presentations, but there's some really interesting intersections here of, of thinking, I think. Um, to children collectively working together, that's, that's a critical thing. Friends, making new friends. And then the challenge of, of exercising agency and self efficacy of, of, of going further, of doing more things, of taking risks. And then the context in terms of um, learning those skills, sharing them together, um, testing them out in a different way, in a different place. Um, so it's interesting that um, we heard already several times, but uh, already this morning, this distinction, and we didn't ever share this at all, but in our minds there are these very distinct areas of learning that um, are informal, learning through play, doing stuff together, we just saw this non-formal learning that happens outside of school, but it's in, within some kind of defined setting, with some kind of um, adult role, facilitating, leading that learning, providing resources, and then the formal learning of being in school. And um, just to reinforce what Kathy was saying, uh, we see the intersection of these and the connection between them as being the powerful model. So um, there's a little bit of STEM floating around in here, engineering, science, math, maybe, and the three illustrations here. And in the informal realm, because I've thought a lot about that in just terms of my own learning as, as a kid, right? Um, being in the world, interacting with the world, and gaining that tacit knowledge, which is um, defined as knowledge that's personal, that's internal, that's difficult to communicate. I've been there, I've been there, I've done that, I know how it is, I know how it works. But you have to have the experience to really understand it as compared to explicit knowledge, external knowledge. So what these kids are doing here, you know, they're just learning engineering by manipulating materials. And Pogliani, who invented this um, idea, you know, we know more than we can tell. A wonderful um, um, writer in this area that has captured the essence of tacit learning and how that has worked with creative people is Edith Cobb, and I highly recommend her book, The Imagination of um, the, the Ecology of Imagination in Childhood. If you don't know that book, it's an absolute classic, and it's it's very very inspiring. I don't have time to go in, on into it um, at the moment. So um, I'll talk briefly about things that I learned years ago through my relationship with Herb Wong, who. Um, is, was a, he, he passed away a couple of years ago, but for almost 10 years, he was a mentor, a collaborator on work that we did in, in uh, California, out of which the book Natural Learning came, and from there, the Natural Learning Initiative. Herb had two passions in life. He had a PhD in science education, and he was a very well-known um, jazz promoter, jazz educator. The high school in, in Berkeley um, was the... Um, the result of many well-known jazz players these days. So Herb was a wonderful guy to work with, and he was always making the um, connection between environmental education and jazz. As this kind of education is kind of like jazz, you know? It's not, <laughs> it's open-ended. It's, it's got these different instruments and these different personalities, and it was just a beautiful analogy. So um, the work with Herb started in 72, with an acre and a half of asphalt and blowing most of our research grant on a bulldozer and then working, <laughs> <laughs> working these wonderful students in the 70s at UC Berkeley, it was just incredible. So we, we created with the community, with the teachers, with her, in about a five year period, we went from asphalt to this. And 
you know, I was a young, crazy, hippie uh, <laughs> professor in those days, and I was just like, okay, this is the next thing we need to do, and, and did it. And then, you, you know, decades later, you look back on it and say, wow, hmm, that was amazing. <laughs> and it, it truly was in the sense of, um, first of all, biodiversity, from asphalt to this number of species and this uh, diversity of place every day for these kids. And, and the idea of the pedagogy of this place, you know, so it, you're creating a, a kind of very special place where a lot of things can happen. So some of the things that came from Herb and other colleagues at the time and this incredible group of teachers that we worked with, so that this was the lab school in the center of town. Um, diversity is sort of ecological, key ecological concepts, interrelationships, adaptation, and change. And we work with these ideas over and over again with teachers with that um, evolving environment that you just saw, what we call DIAC. Um, and I think some of you are on board with this, so I'm not going to go into much detail. So, you know, again, when they uh, intersect with each other, you have high quality. So that environmental yard was about as good as it gets. And from that um, first experiment or first um, 10-year odyssey, actually, we developed this idea of behavior or activity settings and the kind of um, approach to design that we now have in the Natural Learning Initiative and this diversity of components. So we think of fixed components, loose components. Now, the fixed is important because it's identity, it's, it's the constancy. You don't want everything so loose. Uh, but the loose, as we've heard about already, you know, tracks interaction supports all the things I've been talking about already. And then the manufactured and the natural, as I've also mentioned. All of these things go together to create quality. You can't just go with one thing. That is clear. So the, it's the mixing of these that um, creates the quality. So just a couple of quick examples from the environmental yard and how it worked. You know, having this right outside the classroom, indoors, outdoors. Metamorphosis, the butterfly is there. And then, let's be a butterfly. So this is the extension of the learning process. We'll come back to in a second. This was such a powerful place in the community that it was very natural to have an after-school program and a summer program where we did additional kinds of things. Adaptation, technology, out of school. All of these resources are right there in the neighborhood. So it gets the, gets the idea, again, that's been mentioned already, that there's a continuum from play learning to education. It's ongoing. And it always starts with this hands-on, hearts-on uh, type of thing that we heard about yesterday. And it's for sure across the curriculum. Okay, the focus today is science and health, but we figured out in the environmental yard with the teachers and the training programs that we did right there on the environmental yard. So, okay, training professional development time, we just went to the yard and the teachers created a bunch of ex uh, exciting and imaginative ideas about how to use it. So the second, so we talked about DIAC, second would be the learning cycle itself, um, which we, I think, really saw every day happening. So it starts with exploration, free form, free play, discovering, observing, uh, phenomena, natural phenomena in general, recording those observations, expressing them in different kinds of ways, applying them, building the skills, applying them to new areas of problem solving, and then transferring those problem solving skills to other domains of life, in a nutshell. <laughs> um, so we're out, we're, we're doing these things, we're engaged in the learning cycle on a daily basis, going through all those processes, recording, expressing, applying. That drawing was um, the expression of a fourth grader, right? Who from that investigation of the water, the, there were two ponds and a little stream uh, on the yard at that time, managed to piece together the whole hydrologic cycle going on around the planet. Quite amazing. An interesting thing that came up um, working with the 
teaching staff was this um, idea that we went back and forth with her brainstorming these kind of different ways of relating to these environments. You, you can, <laughs> and it became known as the blue, green, yellow. So blue is like really uptight teachers that need to get the end result, or it's a traditional scientific lab where you know the result you, you're meant to get at the beginning. <laughs> and then informal experiences, like, so way too open-ended, like anything goes. There's something in between where the being out in the natural environment, uh, as you've seen, works really well. It's, it's more of a mutual learning process where the teacher is more a facilitator, is helping to inspire children, and, and go with their learning process where, where they want to take it. And it's all about means and ends. So you know, the, maybe some of the ends of, are, are defined because there's curricula objectives to be met, but the means are open-ended in that kind of uh, situation. Or you, you um, <laughs> obviously the yard has a fixed means to some extent, which um, especially after school, you can respond to open-ended. Uh, outcomes. So it was very much an indoor-outdoor situation, um, and Kathy stressed that. So having the real sampling pond right there on the yard, going back to the classroom with a mi microscope investigating the organisms, both third and fourth graders here, um, is critical. So we put together these different dimensions into something called the curriculum switchboard. Don't have time to go through it all today, but it enables teachers to position different kinds of specific lesson plans or daily activities in relation to these ecological concepts, the teaching learning modes, the um, interdisciplinary learning, and I haven't even really talked about the developmental skills and then the learning cycle. So these become the drivers of thinking about specific kinds of activities that can happen on a daily basis when you have that kind of resource right adjacent to the school. Nilda and I went back there last year. This is um, from 1972 to 2016. So the redwood trees that were this high in 72 are 60 or 70 feet tall. Um, the pond no longer exists and has been replaced by fixed play equipment. But, you know, it's like you have to have a philosophical point of view. That pine tree that was, I don't know, maybe five feet high back then is now this beautiful, wonderful, um, welcoming thing to the environmental yard. On the left-hand side, there was a mural that we constructed um, that um, the children and the art teacher at the time did, and then that's been replaced. You can't really see this, but the mural has now a reflection of the changing cultural dimensions of the city. So the new migrant groups that have moved there and their languages uh, is beautifully represented there. The school was uh, severely upgraded to meet um, earthquake standards some years ago, and also a grade, or two grades were added, so it was really conflictful. And I was somewhat involved in that. Um, so there's just all these different dimensions here. But here we are on a Saturday morning, and it's the hangout for the neighborhood still, absolutely. <laughs> And so that's the, that's the big plus, you know, it's like this space that's the school space, but it's also out of school time for um, people living around it. So it's still a pretty good model. And, there's, and the small, very small garden that we had is now a community garden. And the sign that we created back in whatever, 75, the environmental yard is still there announcing. And there you have the redwood trees, you know, still surviving. But the, the whole gardening aspect is is clearly very much alive and well. And this is where it started way back. So there's been a lot of talk about learning through the gardening process. So I'm not going to go into that. But this was a really important thing that was going on already in the early days of environmental yard because it's so easy to do. It is really easy. And it's multidisciplinary. And it doesn't take up much space. And the proof was here. Um, kids were doing these experiments. So here's. Um, dirt from under the asphalt, um, 
dirt that's sort of commonplace dirt, and then dirt on the right-hand side there that is composted, and we're going to plant beans and measure their growth rates, et cetera, et cetera. Coming forward now to wait, what, what we're doing in Wake County and in early childhood, gardening is still the powerful, um, the powerful driver of a lot of science learning and potential for learning and, and all of these relationships that I've been talking about. And Ros is in the audience. Yes! <laughs> so this is Beginning and Beyond in downtown Raleigh, just an incredible place. Uh, um, uh, led by an amazing group of teachers and, and Roz. And um, there was quite a bit of talk yesterday about you know, how we can sustain gardening. So permaculture would be one approach which mixes uh, annual and uh, perennial fruiting and vegetable food plants together. And it becomes a kind of ongoing year-round um, place where you can conduct science activities as in here, what's driven a big hole into the, the kid in, with the red hair saying, why is there a tunnel in this green pepper? <laughs> so the teacher whips out a pair of scissors and they cut open the pepper and find out what's going on. <clears throat> so just to finish up, a couple of other case examples. By the way, that's the magic that happened on the environmental yard. <laughs> Informal. And I wasn't sure where to fit this in, but um, this whole aspect of indoor-outdoor learning is critical, absolutely critical. And we need to get the message across to the architects. The, 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 the scene is the building and the outdoor space, right? That's the school or the institution. And there's uh, two or three architects in the country that really understands this. Uh, one of them, W. D. Arthur in Boston, who we worked with at a Montessori school they created this um, actual outdoor classroom. So it's connected to the school building on the left there by a, a breezeway, but the, the classroom itself is really standing independent in the environment, and it works beautifully. And the windows uh, roll right back, and there's a broad counter, and the teacher's inside, and, and the kids are out collecting things, and, and there's like, exhibitions going on inside. So that's kind of the ultimate um, expression, perhaps, of indoor-outdoor. And you can start to imagine the different forms of educational building where it's pretty much like this, and then there's just an administrative pod somewhere else, and the whole thing is surrounded um, by landscape. Um, one of our absolutely favorite um, spaces is Spanish for Fun, which demonstrates the dramatic change that you can uh, make here. This is in Chapel Hill. Um, Adriana's in the... Yay! Woo! <laughs> and, and Maria Hitt is there too. Has a lot to do with this. So just in the space of um, four years, you know. And so that creates the, 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 the sort of setting where you can start to develop individual, as we call them, incremental developments. And they've done a great job developing their steam station, where kids are working with real tools. And, and by the way, there's a parent, you know, at the end of the, the afternoon, just hanging out, sitting in. And this is what happens with these kinds of spaces. They attract parents. Parents get to know each other. They see what the kids is up to. We were talking, um, uh, Kathy was talking about making this home connection. So, OK, this, this is an experience that's happened during the daytime that then we take home, and we're still talking about it around the meal table in the evening. So there's this sense of shared uh, connection between um, institution and home, really important. Real tools and loose parts, all kinds of stuff to work with. You've just got to get it going. Um, so a lot of what we do is about eco-restoration. So that's the other side of the coin, right? So here's a terrible sight in Moore County, the primary school there that was the former high school, and working with them to restore that site, bringing the longleaf pine from the surrounding pine forest um, against this master plan that we created, which has a peripheral trail all the way around the site. So um, we'll see in a moment how that's used, and then this network of pathways that connect up all the pieces. So it's very typical of the kind of form. And here is the um, kids that come for breakfast at school with the school nurse doing the circuit, 
before class, as she says, getting their brains full of oxygen, ready to go. <laughs> and so this trail um, has a variety of different kinds of learning stations, if you will, around it. There's a bird place, uh, the, there's a running track in the middle, and all of these, of course, have science possibilities, right? So the coach was timing the kids, the kids could time themselves, they could work out speeds and measure the distances and on and on and on. And then there's a, a very nice outdoor classroom adjacent uh, to all of this in the center where children can gather and do those things. Um, planting uh, fruit, this uh, kind of permanent um, fruiting landscape, really important. This example is from the Coombe School in the UK that has done an amazing job. They have 40 species of, or varieties of heritage fruit on their, on their grounds. Coming back to um, Blanche Carter Discovery Park, they, the parents installed this wonderful historic cabin and created a space out the front for gathering. So that is the kind of facility that you need to attract an educator, in this case from state parks, to talk about the cockaded uh, woodpecker that lives in the longleaf pine, engaging the, the children and understanding and extending their, their uh, learning. Um, there was a couple of play workers that came from the UK and worked with children on the idea of a labyrinth, and they worked with the parents and the teachers and the community to install this labyrinth. This was, oh wow, 15 years ago now, and it's still there. It's just what you can do with rocks, and it's a beautiful place. So just the closing now with very simple things, just stones. Just introduce a few stones. Turn overable stones to find out what's living underneath together. Exercising our bodies, exploring the environment, discovering, and then hopefully there's an attentive teacher that's going to latch onto this and say, wow, what is this? Let's go and find out what it is. You know, it doesn't take much. And so this is where it starts. And if you don't have rocks, you can't do the rock project. <laughs> is Andy in the room? So this is, yay! <laughs> so a shout out for Andy Ellison, who's right there and has done this incredible <laughs> work um, using the, the project approach in Randolph County. Randolph County, wow, leaders, incredible. And did a beautiful exhibition on all of this a um, couple of years ago. We learned a lot. So um, a few days ago, I sat down and, and I thought, well, what are all the different kinds of scientific skills that are afforded by these sorts of experiment, uh, experiences? And it's a long list, you know, and you can... Um, many of these things have been um, mentioned already, but this is what this interactive, natural kind of situation, doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be expensive, is going to provide for children. And on, you know, beginning, we will say beginning in um, year zero and onwards through the grades and through the developmental levels. I try not to use grades because this is not just school. <laughs> this is daily life out in the park, wherever it is, exploring. Um, just to finish up, this doesn't have to be expensive. So we're back in the Coombe School in the UK and they have their sunflower patch every year. And it's literacy and it's stories and it's measurement, and it's math, and it's science, and it's counting, it's predictability, and it's the arts, and we're gonna do a Van Gogh thing, and we're gonna have a celebration, so it's culture, it's about birthdays, and what that means, etc., etc. And it's about the sun. So, black polyethylene on their multi-purpose lawn, and they gather, in the giant sunflower. And then over the next few days, they see, you know, as the sun comes back, it returns the life to the grass. Okay, so we're trying to create these citizen scientists so that every 
Every single citizen is scientifically literate, not necessarily a professional scientist, but it begins early in life, this understanding of our human dependency on the natural world, and that the, the future of the biosphere depends on us, human beings. So it's both love, the, the heart, as we heard yesterday, and the understanding and everything that connects those two. Thank you.